there's a riddle, I think it's for physicists mainly, that goes something like, if a tree falls in a forest and there's no one there to hear it, does it still make a sound? And of course that calls into question sort of the physical reality of what produces sound and the fact that sound is also a sense or a perception and the difference between the physical reality and our sense. And I think as chemists, we could take that and relate it to color. What is the true color of something? Is the true color related only to what we see, or is there a physical reality to the color? And the way that we're going to address at least, I think, a part of that question is by looking at the colors of substances in visible light, normal white light, and also under a black light. And we're going to look at substances that are fluorescent and then talk about fluorescence. And I'm going to use four solutions. The first one is simply tonic water. Tonic water contains a naturally occurring organic compound that is extracted and isolated from uh, cinchona bark. It's called quinine. Quinine was the first and most effective anti-malarial agent uh, isolated and produced and is still used in that capacity. That, we see the bubbles, it's also carbonated water. The quinine is used as a flavoring in there. Um, and that's basically a colorless solution. I'm going to fill the, I'm using about 500 milliliters of each just so that I'm always sort of looking through the same volume of solution. I'm gonna put that in, and I'm, <laughs> I'm going to use about 500 milliliters, and I have more distilled water. And in the third beaker, rather than placing uh, distilled water, I'm going to use ethyl alcohol, because the third substance that I want to look at is not soluble in water and is soluble in ethyl alcohol. And again, I'm pretty much going to use all of that. Now the three dyes that we're going to look at the colors of are fluorescine, eosin, and rhodamine. Now those are not actually, uh, exactly substances that roll off the tongue, with the exception probably of fluorescine, which is the most well-known fluorescent dye and is used in a lot of applications. And I'm going to get some gloves here just because I don't really want the dyes all over my hands as well. And I'm going to measure out uh, about 15 milliliters of the fluorescine, about five of the eosin, and about one of the rhodamine because they have different intensities and I want to kind of have um, a similar intensity of color in all of them as we compare colors. So this is the fluorescein. The first dye we're going to look at is fluorescein. We're going to go ahead and pour that. I've got about 15 milliliters of fluorescein. I'm pouring that into the water. I'm going to stir that just to make it uniform there, but that looks really good. Uh, the second beaker contains ethyl alcohol, and the dye that we're going to put in there is eosin. Eosin is insoluble in water, so let's go ahead and pour that into the ethyl alcohol. And we have a nice orange color there. I have a fresh stirring rod. We'll mix that up to get a uniform orange color. And finally, the last dye that we're going to use is rhodamine. Uh, rhodamine is a very intense dye, so I only have about a milliliter of uh, rhodamine that I need there that I've taken into this syringe. And we'll get a milliliter of rhodamine there. And again, I have a clean stirring rod. Let's mix that up. Now for effect, let's take our dyes down from there and just tidy up here just a little bit so that we can look at this under black light as well. But first, let's obviously note the colors under white light. We Obviously, quinine we said is colorless, invisible light. The fluorescein is its characteristic kind of yellow-green color. The eosin is a night bright, bright orange, and the rhodamine uh, fuchsia or pink, red, violet whatever you want to say. Now the question is, what does that look like under black light? And if we can dim the lights here in just a minute, let me just uh, make sure the black light's going to come on here. Yep, and let's go ahead and dim the lights. And what we want to do is compare the colors. Can you see the colors now just with the white light? And they're still, they still look the same. And let's bring the black light next to that and look at the difference in color. And I think what I'm going to do is, if, is that standing good there so that I can come around to the front? Okay. 
And what you should see, just because the black light is kind of cutting a swath through it, is a difference in the color. The first one that is quite obvious, of course, is the quinine. The quinine was, is the beaker on the farthest left in your view. That one was colorless, and now it's glowing a bright blue color under the black light. And you know what? Let's do something else here. I'm going to uh, turn off the light box underneath them, and that should give us a much better fluorescent uh, view of the fluorescent colors. And now you can see the bright blue of the quinine. That's the fluorescence of that. The fluorescein was a yellow color. It's now glowing a bright green, still a, very, a yellow green, but a greenish color. The color of the rhodamine has also changed. Um, and the, uh, ro excuse me, the eosin, which is, uh, was the orange color, although it's, it's still glowing in orange in the black light. And then the rhodamine, which has, uh, was pink and now has an orange glow. So it changed, the rhodamine changed from a, a violet to an orange. The eosin changed from an orange to a yellow, to more of a yellow. Um, so let's just go back here. The quinine was colorless. It's now fluorescing blue under a black light. Um, the fluorescein was yellow. It's fluorescing bright green. The eosin was orange and is fluorescing more of a yellow color. And the rhodamine was pink and is now fluorescing an orange color. And so let's take the lights back up if we've got a good view of, of those. Let's turn off the black light here. We'll just go back to our original colors. And what I want to do is explain briefly what fluorescence is, because those colors are pretty and they do call into question, as we said, you know, what do we see? We think of color as an intrinsic property, but we notice that color is not an intrinsic property of a substance because it depends on what wavelength of light is, is uh, exciting it to begin with. When we see that color of light, that's a transmitted color under visible light. Okay. What that means is that the substance, it's being illuminated with white light. It absorbs certain wavelengths of light and transmits the complementary colors, complementary wavelengths, and those are the colors that we see or perceive. Now, so that has to do with absorbance. And let's look at this, which really explains the difference between absorbance, fluorescence, and phosphorescence. So absorbance, as we know, excites an electron from a ground state, and we've noted that here as S0. The substance absorbs the light energy it's excited to a higher energy level. The electrons are excited to a higher energy level, which we'll call the first excited state. We don't know that it's not the first excited state, so we'll call that S1. Now, the main level is the darker, bold line there, but each electronic energy level also has very closely spaced vibrational energy levels. And that's going to be important because it doesn't go exactly to the ground state. It goes to various vibrational energy levels associated with that excited state of the electron. Now, you might think, well, okay, so it absorbed it, and if we see emission of light, then it just releases that light back. But we notice that it's not the same wavelength because black light is more energetic, lower wavelength, smaller, shorter wavelength than visible light. And we don't normally see ultraviolet light, okay? We're seeing basically the, um, the lowest energy end of the ultraviolet range in the black light. We're really seeing the violet light there. So we know, but it's fluorescing different colors. I mean, the emitted color was either blue or green or yellow or orange, but it wasn't violet, and it certainly wasn't ultraviolet light. So we know that whatever it's absorbing, it's not releasing that exact same wavelength. And that's because we, these different vibrational energy levels. So what happens is it goes to that first excited state. There's a little bit of higher vibrational energy there. That is radiated or um, it is lost via what's called radiationless transfer, okay? So it just loses that by bumping into other molecules. It then goes to the excited, the lowest vibrational state of that excited state. And then from there, it releases the photon of light as it goes from that 
S, true S1 level back down to the ground state. And so you can see if you compare the amount of energy that is absorbed by the ultra, when it's irradiated with ultraviolet light to the amount of energy that's released, there's clearly lower energy released than what is excited. And so although it's excited in the ultraviolet range, the light that is emitted is in the visible range. Now there's, that's fluorescence. So fluorescence is basically um, a very fast phenomenon and it's very short-lived. Um, you only observe fluorescence in the presence of the irradiated light. Okay? So now that I don't have the black light there anymore, it's not fluorescing. I'm simply looking at the transmitted color due to visible light. There is another type of light emission which is very similar, and I always love this, but different, and that's called phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is also an emitted light or an afterglow that occurs when something usually, and it can be irradiated either with uh, visible or with uh, ultraviolet light. Phosphorescence is what we think of as the normal glow-in-the-dark uh, phenomenon, all the glow-in-the-dark type toys. What you notice about the glow-in-the-dark is that that lasts, that color lasts long after the light source that is exciting it has been removed. And that's the wonder of glow-in-the-dark type toys. And that's very similar. You've still got excitation and absorbance of light, absorption of light energy from whatever source. Okay, but instead of going back to the S1 state, basically, remember we said those closely spaced vibrational energy levels were going to be important because what you have is a triplet excited state, which is a little lower in energy than the singlet. You can only absorb directly from a singlet to a singlet. But you've got these closely spaced vibrational energy levels here. And you can actually get a phenomenon where the electron goes from a higher vibrational energy level here in S1, essentially across, okay? So in, you know, in management terms, that would be a horizontal or a lateral move rather than a vertical uh, move, okay? So we have a horizontal move to one of these energy levels, then again it goes down to the lowest vibrational state, and then from there it emits the photon of light energy, and that's the typical phosphorescence. You know, it's a fun phenomenon to look at. Everybody lo likes glow in the dark and fluorescence, and it calls into question the nature of perception and physical properties versus our senses. What do we see versus what causes color and so on? And it also brings into play core concepts truly in electron and atomic structure. So you can have a lot of fun with this and really, and you know, I've gone into a lot of detail here on the difference between absorbance, fluorescence, and uh, phosphorescence, but it's something that students are familiar with because of, as I said, the glow-in-the-dark phenomenon. And you can decide, you know, do you really want to talk about vibrational energy levels there because that does add another level of complexity to your standard explanation. But as with a lot of things, you know what, you tailor the explanation to what the students are asking. And sometimes what will happen is, you know, a student will ask you the difference between fluorescence and phosphorescence or say, aren't they the same thing? And you go, well, not quite. And the student might go off and do a little further research uh, in this day of the, inter uh, the Internet age and you Google anything and you can immediately find the answer to this. So we've tried to give you basically what you can do at a variety of levels, energy levels, if you will, of your students in terms of the explanation. Thank you.